The story you are about to hear starts off as a tragic, though common case of murder for inheritance. We'll even have a legendary Nebraskan detective work his magic that leads to a plot twist that no one saw coming, leading to arrests and convictions. But once we get further into the story, the plot really thickens when a young forensic investigator was extremely bothered by a piece of evidence found at the crime scene. It was so innocuous that the police and the celebrated detective himself disregarded it as irrelevant. But it bugged this young investigator. To her it was a loose end she needed to answer. And when she did, she would take the case wildly in another direction and even when you think things are finished, the ending gives you one more shocking twist. My name is Killian and welcome to True Crime Stories. It was the morning after Easter of 2006, a two-story farmhouse in Murdoch, Nebraska stood eerily still in the early morning hours. Usually Wayne and Charmin Stock, married now almost 40 years and both well into their late 50s, would be up by now doing chores, prepping for another day of running their successful hay business. That's why a sinking feeling came over Andrew Stock as he let himself into his parents' house that morning to help out with the business. The quiet was deafening when he knew how diligent his parents were. He lingered in the home office a bit, with still no signs of mom or dad. He started heading up the stairs to their bedroom and stopped before he even made it to the door. There was no need to go any further, nor any reason to think his parents were still alive. Killings in Murdoch, Nebraska was not a thing, especially one this brutal which made the police lean towards it being personal because Charmin and Wayne, proud grandparents of four, God-fearing, well-loved in their small community, both had their heads blown off with a shotgun. The police immediately, and rightfully so, honed in on the man that called it in himself, the son, Andrew Stock. Because this double homicide made little sense if Andrew wasn't the killer because detectives did learn that he was the beneficiary of that two-story farmhouse and that profitable hay business. Andrew Stock had to process and mourn his deceased parents within the walls of an interrogation room for hours. But the interrogators were eventually satisfied that he wasn't involved because his alibi checked out and there was simply no indication that he had any falling out with his parents and in terms of the inheritance, they had already pretty much given him the reins to everything. So it was back to square one for the police. And in a small town that had never dealt with anything remotely close to this disturbing, the sheriff knew that he was not equipped to handle such a case. After his only suspect was checked off the list, he was already ringing the Nebraska Crime Scene Investigation Unit in which David Cafode himself took interest in the case. This is the celebrated Nebraskan detective we mentioned before, a criminal profiler with a reputation of finding evidence when no one else could and closing those cold hard cases. He was given the keys to the case and the clues were as follows. Wayne Stock was shotgunned in the leg as well as two more times in the head in the hallway just outside the bedroom. Charmin Stock was shotgunned once in the face at point blank range while clutching a phone within the bedroom. There were no signs of forced entry to the home though a window was open and a screen removed. A gold ring was recovered on the kitchen floor. Shotgun casings littered the driveway along with an LED flashlight and a marijuana pipe as well. There was also a disturbing blood splatter shadow left after a spray of blood hits a person before hitting the wall in the hallway. 
So what Kofod took away from all this evidence was that an open window wasn't too alarming because Burdock was that kind of town where everyone knew everyone and people simply left things open, which in turn also made the screen removal a bit pointless since they could have just went in the front door. The gold ring could have simply been dropped by any host of people that visited the stocks, so it had no significance. Shotgun casings were important, of course, to identify and match the murder weapon at a later point. The flashlight, though, indicated to Kafode that the perpetrator didn't want to turn on the house lights, most likely knowing the stocks were at home. And considering that blood splatter shadow, Detective Kafode realized that there had to be two assailants, one that pulled the trigger and one standing in the way of the splatter. Since there was no sign of blood splatter on Charmin's body, it wasn't her that made that shadow from her own husband's blood. He also deduced by the violent nature of the crime, a grudge against Wayne or Charmin or both was likely the motive. And finally, the marijuana pipe was rainbow colored, leading the seasoned detective to believe the killers were young. So Kafod's profile of the killers read like this. They were looking for two young men. The killers knew the victims. And because nothing seems to have been stolen and due to the overkill of this crime, this had all the earmarks of a revenge killing due to a grudge with one or both of the victims. Both parties were likely in contact with each other in the last 24 hours. As tips start to pour in, Kafo took interest in one particular name, a man named Matt Livers, Wayne Stock's nephew. The 28-year-old had a prior disagreement with Wayne and Charmin on who would inherit a certain house they owned. Matt felt it should have been him. The Stocks disagreed, and he left on bad terms. On April 17th, a state and county investigator brought Matt into an interrogation room where he did admit that he had a disagreement with his aunt and uncle, but denied having anything to do with the shooting. After a few hours of sticking to his story, he was released. Then, a paperboy comes forward and said he noticed a tan four-door sedan oddly parked near the Stocks residence on the cemetery side on the morning of the crime. He also noticed the same car driving around the vicinity the night before passing him at dangerous speeds. Investigators were able to locate a 1998 light tan Ford Contour at the home of 21-year-old Nicholas Sampson, and lo and behold, he was the cousin of Matt Livers. And of course, coincidentally, the car had just been cleaned and detailed. The car didn't produce any evidence when searched, but Detective Cafode knew he was on the right track. He ordered both men to be surveilled with extra tails on Matt Livers. Their movements were tracked and even their garbage was being sifted through. Nothing new was learned except to confirm that Matt and Nicholas were close. On April 25th, they brought Matt in for a lie detector test and another round of interrogations where Matt stuck by his story again. The difference this time was he was going to have to reiterate it for 11 straight hours. It wasn't until the lie detector results came in did things change. Matt was told that he had failed miserably. This broke Matt's resolve and he confessed that he did murder his aunt and uncle because he was angry about them not leaving him a house in their will. So he and his cousin, Nicholas Sampson, went over and shot them both. Detective David Cafode had impressed the law community once again by accurately profiling that it would be two killers, check, two young men, check, killers knew the stocks, check, grudge against Wayne and Sharman, check. The only problem was they couldn't find the murder weapons, and Cafode also knew that confessions being that they could be coerced wasn't strong enough evidence for his liking. So he snapped on some rubber gloves and ordered a second search of that tan Ford Contour, which he was going to painstakingly comb through personally this time. 
Inch by inch, he examined the interior. No part of the car was to be left undisturbed. And then, just under the dashboard, he was able to spot a minuscule speck of blood, which would come back as belonging to Wayne Stock. He officially had those boys dead to rights. Both Matt Livers and Nicholas Sampson were arrested, charged with the stock murders, and thrown in jail to await their day in court. And now let me introduce you to Christine Gaybig, a young investigator for the Sheriff's Crime Lab who went over the evidence from this case. And there was one particular item that bothered her, and that was the gold ring found on the kitchen floor. Christine has always been a stickler for details, which made her good at her job, and this ring to her needed to be accounted for. Even though Detective Gafode had written it off as having nothing to do with the murders, she decided to do a little extracurricular research and found out something about Charmin Stock that made this ring stick out like a sore thumb. What she learned was that Charmin was pretty much an amazing woman. Not only did she help run the hay business, she found the time to be a loving wife, mother, grandmother, and running a baking business out of her own kitchen. Those closest to her remarked that she kept her workspace immaculate, obsessively clean. That fact had Christine's CSI brain turning because to her, this meant for that ring to be on Charmin's floor without her noticing it or picking it up was highly unlikely. So now that the ring had a story to tell, she studied it and noted that it seemed to be a man's ring with an inscription instead of being on the inside, oddly was on the outside, which read, Love Always, Corey and Ryan. There was also a small jeweler's logo, which unfortunately, she had no idea, so it was going to be a tedious task to track the maker, and it wouldn't be until a couple of weeks later that she would call an a and Jewelers in Buffalo, New York that she would find the origins of this ring. Christine is greeted by an employee of the store named Mary Martino. Christine identified herself and the nature of her call, and to her luck, Mary was a bit of a true crime buff and seemed genuinely excited to help. She also told Christine that if she had even called an hour later, Mary would have already disconnected the phone lines and they wouldn't even be having this conversation ever. Because her employers, a and Jewelers, was already out of business and answering the phone to tell people they no longer existed was one of her last duties. Mary Martino for the next three days of her own time, carefully looked over past receipts and sifted through documents until she finally found what she was looking for. She called Christine and told her that the gold ring was sent to a Walmart in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. Christine could not thank Mary enough. Now her next step was to simply call Walmart. She had to learn the hard way that you don't just call Walmart and expect to get answers. You have to call numerous times before you are connected with the right person that will connect you with the right department and pray you are connected with the right person from that department. Christine had to call 70 times before she learned that a man named Ryan, the same Ryan from the inscription Corey and Ryan, had placed the order. When she got a hold of Ryan, he had an interesting story for her, that his red pickup truck was stolen with that gold ring in his glove compartment. She checked the police records and he did report his truck missing two days before the murders. Ryan's alibi kept him in Wisconsin, plus he was 500 miles away from the crime scene with no connections to the stocks whatsoever. The likelihood of him committing these murders was slim. So now, what Christine had to do next was find out who stole Ryan's truck. And that turned out to be a lot easier than dealing with Walmart because the Wisconsin PD had already done that for her and even had the two culprits in custody. The same two state and county detectives that interrogated Matt Livers flew to Wisconsin to do what they do best, extract a confession. 
17-year-old Jessica Reed was a former honor roll student that fell into the wrong path after her parents' heartbreaking divorce. She starts dating Gregory Fester, just 19 years old and was already a seasoned burglar who also had a knack for hot wiring cars. They both realized it must have been love when they broke into a house together and came away with an envelope full of cash and a shotgun. One night, they spotted a real nice red pickup truck, perfect for a romantic, drug-fueled road trip to see the ocean for the first time. Like a GTA magician, Greg was in the truck and fired up the engine. Jessica got into the passenger side and they were off towards the west. Jessica starts searching the truck for valuables and found a gold ring in the glove compartment that was inscribed, Love Always, Corey and Ryan. She thought the ring looked cool, but it was made for a man. She slipped it onto Greg's finger, but he didn't want to wear it. So she wore it on her thumb, and even then, it was still loose. For Jessica and Greg, there was only one way to bankroll this dream vacation. And of course, that was to rob homes along the way. Once in Iowa, the first house they hit went off without a hitch because the homeowners weren't home. They made off with some valuables as well as another shotgun. They vandalized another Iowan home before exiting, leaving thousands of dollars worth of damage and making off with just $300. The party brazenly continued down the highway as the two teenagers smoked marijuana from their pipe as well as getting high off cocaine and cough syrup. And you can see where this story is heading. Heading straight into the sleepy town of Murdoch, Nebraska that Easter Sunday night in 2006. It was random which house they would stop at. The houses were pretty far apart, so as they were coming down from their high, they became more agitated with each other and agreed to just hit the next house they came across. That's when they saw a two-story farmhouse, a bit far off from the road, with no lights on. Greg turned off the headlights and pulled into the stock's driveway. It seemed perfect for what they were planning and no visible vehicles, each armed with a shotgun. They quietly got out of the truck. They crept to the side of the house, looking for a way in. Greg felt it was their lucky day when he found the first window to be open. He removed the screen and climbed into the laundry room. He signaled Jessica to go to the back door where he let her in. As they made their way around with a flashlight, they heard snoring coming from upstairs. While walking across the kitchen floor, the gold ring slipped off Jessica's thumb and rolled away. Not knowing where it went, she simply left it and followed Gregory, who was now heading up the stairs. Most likely, his line of thought was confronting the homeowners directly with shotguns in hopes of scoring big. Earlier that day, Wayne and Charmin Stock just had a wonderful Easter. Charmin was extremely worried all morning that it would start raining and ruin Easter for her grandchildren. Wayne tried to reassure her by reading the forecast that rain was very slim, but the sky did look very ominous to him as well. They dressed in their Sunday best and went to church. By the time church finished, it turned into a beautiful day and Charmin could not be more thrilled to rush home and start hiding colorful eggs around the farm. Everything went just as she planned. Her four grandchildren had so much fun finding the eggs. The grown-ups all gathered around for laughs, and even after everyone left, their son Albert came back to their house that evening where they just sat, talked, and enjoyed the beautiful night. Albert Stock recalled that when he left his parents' house, his final memory of them were his mom and dad holding hands as they went back inside the house. Gregory Fester was now standing outside the stock's bedroom door. He pushed it open, found the light switch, and flooded the room with light. Wayne immediately woke up and still in a bit of a daze, automatically shoved the covers off himself, got onto his feet and went directly towards the intruders. Gregory, not expecting the man to come at him like that, 
froze a bit, but jarred into action when Jessica screamed, Do something! Greg aimed at Wayne's leg, blasted his knee apart. This didn't prevent Wayne from still lunging at Greg, trying to wrestle the shotgun away. The struggle spilled into the hallway. Greg, not being able to overpower a much stronger man, cries to his girlfriend, shoot him! Jessica, without hesitation, cocked her shotgun. Wayne looked up and stared directly into the barrel with his right eye. Jessica pulled the trigger. Greg gets up and with his shotgun, fires another round, blowing apart the back of Wayne's head. This would create the blood splatter shadow of Jessica, who was now covered in blood. The pair goes back into the bedroom, where they find Charmin with the phone in her hand, trembling, crying, trying to call the police. How she pleaded with them when she saw them return. Greg you? walked up to her put the shotgun right in her face and fired, obliterating most of her head as she slumped onto the floor. The killers, shaken by what they did, fearing someone heard the gunshots, started to head down the stairs and nearly fell over when a mind-fucking scream reverberated the house. Charmin Stock had let out one final, painful, sorrow-filled scream that rippled in the air and into her killer's ears. The two scrambled back to their senses and made their way to the pickup truck where bullets were dropped along with the flashlight and when the truck doors were opened, their marijuana pipe fell out as well. They pulled out of the driveway and peeled off. Jessica Reed told the interrogators everything. For the former cheerleader and honor roll student, her conscience ate away at her. She says she hears Charmin's agonizing scream every night, keeping her awake. She knew that she had taken everything from that woman, and that woman made sure she used every last bit of her being to haunt her forever. Jessica stated she was ready for the punishment awaiting her. Both Jessica Reed and Gregory Fester were found guilty and given life in prison. And you would think that Matt Livers and his cousin, Nicholas Sampson, would be exonerated of this crime, yes? Not to Detective Cafode, who insisted that the two boys had to have had a hand in all of this because they fit his profile so well. Two young men who knew the stocks and had a grudge. And what about Wayne Stock's blood found in the tan car they were driving in? Well, that's where this case takes another truly unexpected turn. Enter Special Prosecutor Clarence Mock. A special prosecutor is independent of an office that would normally exercise jurisdiction in a criminal investigation to avoid potential conflicts of interest or to facilitate subject matter area expertise. In short, the person that audits the audit that polices the police without bias or prejudice. The first red flag that came to light was the confession video of Matt Livers. Turns out, Matt had an IQ of only 63. The video revealed that the state and county interrogators were feeding Matt information that he would eventually regurgitate after 11 hours of grueling questioning. The video also captured the interrogators bullying and threatening Matt, a developmentally disabled man. After confessing to the crime, when the lie detector results showed deception, Matt simply gave the name of a person he was closest to because they wanted a second name. Special Prosecutor Clarence Mock, disgusted by what he's seen on these tapes, continued into his investigation which led him straight to the top. The legendary Detective David Cafode and released this earth-shattering statement. The evidence demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt that David Cafode planted the DNA. The Nebraskan law enforcement world was rocked to its very core. The man that was known for finding evidence that no one else could was now under a microscope 
for planting evidence when no one else was looking. And the hits didn't stop there. Mock would also go on to accuse Gaffode of meddling with the results of Matt Rivers' lie detector test to give it a false reading. David Gaffode was found guilty of falsifying evidence and given four years in prison. Now, of course, the question in everyone's mind, how many innocent people did he frame to create and keep his illustrious name? David Gaffode, to this day, still vows his innocence. The state dropped all charges against Nicholas Sampson after being imprisoned for the past five months. Matt Livers would also have all charges dropped after seven months. He sued the state of Nebraska and David Cafode for fabricating evidence and coercing a false confession. He and his cousin were rewarded $1.6 million. In the end, there's no happy ending to this story. Two beautiful people lost their lives for no reason. Two stupid teenagers effectively lost theirs as well. And a fame-hungry detective nearly destroyed the lives of two young men if a young forensic investigator hadn't puzzled over a random gold ring, which paved the way for a special prosecutor to tie up the loose ends. Subscribe if you enjoyed this story, or a thumbs up will do. And I don't get nearly as much comments as I would like, because I love to read your thoughts. My name is Killian. Always protect the ones you love, and don't forget to show love to the ones that protect you.